Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. This month's program is very special. Our guest is one of the 20th century's most highly respected political activists and religious innovators. Mohandas K. Gandhi is not only the father of India's independence, but also he continues to inspire and guide activists who are working for peace, human rights, economic justice, and spiritual growth. Mohandas Gandhi based everything he did on a humble but relentless pursuit for truth. He really deserves the respectful title that people of India have given him, the Mahatma, the great soul. And so I'm very happy to welcome Mohandas K. Gandhi, the Mahatma, here to our studio. Thank you so much for being here. Namaste. That's um, my peace greeting. Okay. Ano Plaitavo Kritab Yantu Visvata. That means in English, may noble truths from all over the world come to us as we seek tonight to understand truth and love. Well, that's, that says it right there. We, <laughs> we got the extra rest of the hour to do whatever we want with, because you've, you've done it right oh, there. Oh, no, we, we need to go deeper. <laughs> There's more. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to start by looking at some of, a couple of uh, episodes in your, the development of how you became who you are. I think a lot of people watching this program won't know that when you were almost 19 years old, your family sent you to England to go to law school. 
And while you were in England, you had a chance to experience a very different world from where you grew up. And I wonder if you could uh, tell us what you experienced in England that helped shape you into becoming the person that you became. Well, I did not know as much at the time, but England uh, affected me. I went there to learn how to change India to be like the United Kingdom. And I came in contact there with uh, many different uh, inspirations after getting, and including getting the law degree, but more important, I suppose, in the long run was my experience with the Vegetarian Society, with the women's uh, wealth uh, suffrage move movement, as well as some people from the New Age perspective on critiquing the world we live in. So these influences stayed with me later on. One of the things that in, in the movie that was made in 1982 about your life and in books I've, I've read about you, one of the big turning points is uh, something that happened in 1893 when you were like 23 or 24 years old. It was in South Africa, the train trip. Uh, you had just arrived about a week before in South Africa to practice law. And as an attorney, you had a first class ticket for the train. But in South Africa, even then, 100 years ago, it was very racist and you got thrown off the train for being in the, in the first class uh, car. And this was in Maritzburg and you spent the night in, off where they had thrown you off and pondering things. Tell us what that experience was like for you and what you came up with. That experience fashioned and directed the rest of my life. That was a very difficult experience for me. I sat there freezing out there in that mountain town in uh, the middle of winter, debating whether to go back to India or stay in South Africa to fight for the rights of Indians. We were regarded as coolies, a derision mm -hmm. uh, to us. And um, so that experience along with the rest of the experiences on that trip to Johannesburg um, made me make up my mind to stay and, and, and work for the Indian rights. You also, as I understand it, um, were able to resolve that, that evening, that night, that, that, that a nonviolent method was the way that had to be pursued. Well, I cannot say it blossomed in that way. I just could not understand how one human being could treat another one the way I was treated that night. And so for me, the dignity of human treatment was what moved me. Mm -hmm. I wrote my autobiography in the late 1920s, entitling it Autobiography, the Story of My Experiments with Truth. So starting from that experience over the next number of years, almost 20 years in South Africa, I developed that commitment to nonviolence. But that was not clear to me that evening uh -huh. what was going to happen. Uh -huh. You ended up staying in South Africa, South Africa, as you said, for like close to 20 years uh, until about 1914 when you were about 45 at that point, which is middle aged. And then you came home to, to India. You had already been developing a huge amount of the, the theory and the practice that you invested in India for that movement, but you had already been developing that in South Africa and using it over the course of two decades. Uh, what, what were you doing in South Africa that, as you moved along that path? There are a whole series of experiences in South Africa. In the early times, I was dressed as an English lawyer, you know, uh, and was successful in South Africa as a lawyer. But I spent my time educating Indians about ways of, of conducting themselves and living. Because there was this, a, a large English, a significant English uh, uh, Indian minority in South Africa. 18,000 in Transvaal uh, uh, area where uh -huh. I was, uh -huh. yes. 
it's yeah. significant in all types from the indentured servants to the business people who were mm -hmm. very successful. Mm -hmm. And so they, the effort of the United Kingdom was to control us mm -hmm. and control our movements. And as that started happening, uh, it, it, uh, it moved us to have, be in conflict. Mm -hmm. And so I went from an educator to a what we called passive resistor uh, during this period of time. But, but you didn't stay with the term passive resistance. I, re I did not like that term. Uh -huh. uh, in 1906 is when nonviolence was born. Uh -huh. October, September 11th, 1906, very important day. Um, at that point, uh, the United Kingdom, through that uh, place we lived, uh, posted in the Johannesburg Gazette regis uh, legislation that would restrict our travel in very serious ways. It would demand every Indian eight years and over to be fingerprinted, to, to be certified, and, and um, registered um, and restrict our travel. And they could go after our women in their homes as well as on the street. And this was insulting. So people were talking violence. Mm -hmm. Violence and vengeance was in the air. And here I was, a spokesman for the Indian people and not committed to violence. What should I do? And that's where passive mm -hmm. resistance was born on September 11th at a meeting. But, but you went beyond passive resistance to a more active kind of of nonviolence. Well, it, and we'll it, talk about that more during the program. But it's, it, yes, it's, the birth it's, it's evolving changed there. the name. And we could talk about yeah. that. We well, should let, talk let, about let's, that. Let's do that. You you came up with a with a term that combined two other words, and you coined a new word out of it. So tell us about that. I did not like passive resistance. I am not passive, and I did not want to be construed that way. So I had a contest, and my cousin Magdalene Law Gandhi came up with the term satagraha firmness in a good cause. And I thought about that and I said, Satyagraha, which means truth. Satya means truth and uh -huh. love. Uh -huh. And graha is clinging to, so yeah. clinging to the truth. And that appealed uh -huh. much more to me. Uh -huh. It's truth force. We get to go deeper into that. Uh -huh. that. That has much meaning. Well, so I, I want to read a, a quotation and ask you to comment on it. There's an author who described your Satyagraha um, in a way that I've found very useful. I want to read this quotation and, and invite you to comment on it. Uh, and this author says, Satyagraha in practice is a method for resolving conflict. Traditionally, conflict between opposed parties is resolved, in quotation part, marks, only by the acknowledged dominance of one antagonist over the other. The assumption is that one side can, see, can succeed only at the expense of the other. If there is to be a winner, there must be a loser. And Satyagraha challenges this assumption. Rather than trying to conquer the opponent or annihilate his claims, Satyagraha tries to resolve the sources of conflict. And so this makes it very different from other kinds of social um, action methods. Um, Satyagraha seeks to resolve conflict by persuading the adversary of the common value of its nonviolent vision that the adversary and, in fact, all of us have much more to gain in harmony than in discord. So instead of excluding the adversary from the solution, it kind of brings the people together to, to work on it. Um, and um, so instead of viewing the adversary as an enemy to be overcome, it's a participant in the search for a truthful solution to the conflict. It's that a, is it's, true. It's just a, a whole different model. That is true. Uh, the, what, the way you describe it is the basic elements. You have to put satyagraha together with ahimsa, which means nonviolence. Okay. And you have to put that together with tapasha, which means suffering. Those three relate to do exactly what you described. Okay. Um, the, I, I want to also quote um, a, a, a briefer quote from Lewis Fisher, who wrote a very, very good book. Uh, an auto, uh, a biography of, of you uh, that summarized your use of satyagraha in this way. 
<clears throat> and uh, this is the vindication of truth, not by infliction of suffering on the opponent, but on oneself. And this is, you That's mentioned the suffering this. part. Yeah, the opponent must be weaned from error by patience and sympathy. Weaned, not crushed. Satyagraha assumes a constant beneficent interaction between contestants with a view toward their ultimate reconciliation. Violence, insults, and superheated propaganda obstruct this end. So does that still sound right to you? That sounds right. Uh, you need to understand the meaning of sat, satya. Uh -huh. In Hindi, it means truth, means love, means reality, mm -hmm. means that which is. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of that is that all reality is sustained by the force of truth and love. Mm -hmm. The whole universe and every person. So I regard you as having that in you, as well as every mm -hmm. other person. So if I regard truth, God, in some mm -hmm. people's word and my word too, mm -hmm. uh, residing in you and in me, I cannot do you harm. Mm -hmm. I have to recognize that no matter how many bad things or evil things you may do, it's still there. Mm -hmm. And that's the effort, is to connect with that and understand and love that and then resolve the differences. Mm -hmm. In the civil rights movement in the United States, Martin Luther King drew very heavily on your writings and your examples, and he adapted it to our own culture and our own modern era here. And he wrote um, a book called Stride Toward Freedom, that was, he wrote after the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott of 1955-56. There's a couple sentences here I want to read that I think are just right on uh, on the same track here. This, and I wonder if you could comment on what King wrote in this book of his. He says, a basic fact that characterizes nonviolence is that it does not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win their friendship and understanding. It avoids not only external physical violence, but also internal violence of spirit. Nonviolent resistors not only refuse to shoot their opponents, but also refuse to hate them. That expresses very well what I am trying to uh -huh. say. Uh -huh. And I must mention, I don't know Dr. King well enough, but my understanding is Christian. And that goes back to my start in England when I was acquainted for the first time with the Christian Bible. Uh, I knew Christians in India, but my impression was not good of them. Mm -hmm. I saw them as having brandy in one hand and beef in the other. Uh -huh. But when I read the Bible, I changed uh -huh. that thought. Uh -huh. I, especially the New Testament and the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. the love that is it conveyed there, mm -hmm. love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who curse you. Mm -hmm. Turn the other cheek. Stand strong. Yeah. This inspired passive resistance. This gave me a way to uh, live the way I did in that 1906 uh, first time uh, uh, fighting uh, the government's intended controlling and oppression of us. Mm -hmm and the rest of my life. Right. Uh, Martin Luther King said at one point that, uh, that Jesus sort of laid out like the theory of what we should be doing and that you and your example showed that it was actually possible to do it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that made sense for social justice. So he really credits you a lot, but he makes the same linkages that you're making just now. That, that makes a lot of sense to me because I believe that sincere people from every religion in the depth of their religion have the same basic mm -hmm. calling, mm -hmm. the same basic core understanding. Yeah. Maybe we use different words, maybe you express it somewhat differently, but um, I, I felt that Jesus was the prime satyagrahi uh -huh. when I read about him uh -huh. in the scripture. Yeah. 
the you you use the term ahimsa, the not harming, the 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 the, the renunciation of harming. It's a, just a flat, flat out prohibition of harming. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say about about that? I, I that do. Uh, it's it's not just renouncing harming. It's unwilling to harm. This gets into the mind and the passions and the will, the powers within us, the discipline of that. And the Gita inspired me more the in this Gita area. The Hindu scripture. The Hindu scripture, yeah. yeah. It, it, it has a, 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 a basic guideline on how to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, so if, if I regard truth as being in you, I cannot harm you. Mm -hmm. I love you mm -hmm. and I treat you accordingly. I might fight policies and activities mm -hmm. that are being done by willingness to suffer and die, mm -hmm. but I could not do that with you. So Ahimsa, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, Ahimsa teaches this, mm -hmm. and it it's, goes into much more than physical expressions, psychological, mm -hmm. emotional, uh, all relationships are guide Ahimsa, Ahimsa and Satyagraha go together like this. Right. Right. There's another connection that uh, people nowadays who work for nonviolence and is evident in, in your writings from many decades ago as well, and that's the connection between means and ends. The, the notion that if we want to have peaceful and just ends, if that's the goal that we seek, then we have to use peaceful and just methods to get there. And in fact, the methods that we use will lead to the ends that are inherent in, in those means. It's like, you know, if you want an acorn, if you plant an acorn, you get an oak tree out of it. Uh, yes, you know. yes. And, and, I, and I know this was strong in, in your writing. You, I've read things that you've written connecting means and ends. It, it, it's implied in all the things we've been saying uh -huh. If I'm trying to come to an agreement with you because I feel you're, you're violating the truth in me as I understand it, I have a choice. I can beat you, mm -hmm. or I can acquiesce, or I can work it out. Mm -hmm. And if I work it out by beating you, your mind still thinks the same thing, your heart still feels, and you feel yeah. it more intensely yeah, because I beat you. Right, right. So yeah, I, would, I would add that's, resentment that's to it. That's a violation yeah. of, of my understanding right. of truth yeah. and love and, and the whole yeah. meaning of, of being human. Yeah. This is the human way. There, there's a, an, another related thing, and that's um, a lot of times when people are in conflict or when people have, when some difference arises, people assume polarization. They assume that there is this inherent division between those guys versus us guys. The, the people who are good versus the people who are evil or the this country versus that country or whatever. And you always assumed, not polarization, but you always assumed that it was possible to find a solution. Well, they called me a coolie. Uh -huh. They called us a coo coolies uh -huh. in uh -huh. South Africa. Uh -huh. You know, that implies that I am less, uh -huh. that I am different, that I am something strange and weird and, and often bad yeah. in, in their mind. And that's what I started resisting from day one. Uh -huh. uh, polarization is in that method. Yeah. But if we assume that they're that good in everyone, then we try to the, work it out the, based on that. So you can transcend the polarization and not be caught up in this binary world of us versus them. And you try to understand what's going on yeah. within the other person yeah. that's making them do this. You, you uh, were quoted one time as saying that you were a practical realist. Uh, you know, people, people have the notion that, that nonviolence is uh, nice and moral, but not very realistic. And you described yourself as a practical realist. And um, I, I appreciate that. So it, it's, uh, well, I, I really work. am resolved on, on living this way. And I believe this way is the right way for human living. I might not have the, the truth on all the particulars mm -hmm. 
that the truth that you have may correct me, mm -hmm. but I believe it. So mm -hmm. to be practical in this regard is not to ignore these yeah. serious things, yeah. but to work with it. And that's what I mean by being practical and realistic. Yeah. Well, you also were, were very willing to change your mind if you had if you discovered a better truth later on, you could do that and say, well, good, I've, I've grown, I've developed this, um, as opposed to the people who get locked in and just dig in their heels and won't change. In fact, your autobiography, you subtitled The Story of My Experiments with Truth. Right. I mean, to, to call your approach to, to seeking the truth, experimenting with it, wow, how, how open that is. I experimented with all facets of my yeah. life. Yeah, diet. Diet, health, everything. where to live, yeah. The, the whole experience of in India of working yeah. with um, the Congress to yeah. get independence yeah, for the Congress India. Party was the, the party Congress Party, the Indian yeah. Congress Party. That's yeah. right. Uh, it's all trying to discern yeah. what's the truth and yeah. and experiment with ways of accomplishing it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There, and another related thing is is um, you you always had a, a good way of, of, although you were doing serious stuff, you were always willing to not take yourself too seriously and to renounce ego and to live simply. Nowadays, people have this thing they call voluntary simplicity, and you were doing that, you know, 100 years ago, you know, trying, trying to uh, eat lower on the food chain and not be bogged down with too many material possessions and, and to not get your ego wrapped up in possessions and, and uh, status and stuff, that you could uh, be very humble in how you did this, and, uh, which is remarkable. Well, if we would examine the teaching of the Gita, you would understand that thoroughly. To me, you have to become a cipher to connect with truth. You have to get down to zero? You have to be like dust. Uh -huh. and how many people do that? Yeah. But I tried every day in my ashrams to meditate and pray mm -hmm. and, yeah. and discipline my mind to control my passions uh -huh. yeah. so that whether it rained or, sh or shined, whether I experienced the worst catastrophe or the best blessing, uh -huh. it didn't change me. Uh -huh. That's a discipline. It takes yeah. hard work. Oh, yeah. Somebody, a, a, a journalist, asked you one time for the secret of your success, and you said, renounce and enjoy, which I thought was wonderful yes. advice. Yes. <laughs> right, right along the same line. Yes. Um, um, there, there is another kind of detachment that you did, which was a, a detachment from um, not being obsessed with the results. You would, you would do these activities with the idea that you want to accomplish a particular goal, but your sense was if you're doing the activities right from that standpoint of truth and love, then the, then the results, that's up to God. And so you were quite detached from the results and didn't obsess over it like a lot of politically active people do, whether it's elected politicians or activists you know, on the outside. Um, so how, how did you... Um, uh, it's obviously comes out of the same roots. Same roots. Be, being able to be conscious of doing the right activity and then leave the results up to God. Similar in chapter 2 of the Gita to the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. where it teaches you this, Anasakti, no desire. From desire comes anger, greed, and so forth. That, so that's detachment, Anasakti in our language. Nishkam karma means uh, letting go of the end, letting go of the result. So you put yourself into life with all your heart and soul to these critical things about truth and love. But it's, you do it and you don't control the results. Mm -hmm. You just let go. So that, that, that's detachment, especially in things yeah. where people are being killed or injured. It's very that's, difficult. That's hard, yeah. You, you were raised Hindu, but my understanding was that your mother had some background in the Jain religion and that the, 
the Hindu priest where you were a kid was quite willing to, to read from scriptures of other religions, from the, from the Muslim Quran, from the, the Christian Bible, from other sources. And, and so maybe from an early age, you had this sense of the connectedness of, of, of all the faiths and the ability to, to draw and sort of translate across. Much could be said about my relationship with my mother and, and, and these things. Uh, but yes, the Hindu way is very much accepting of, of different beliefs and religions. Mm -hmm. that's, that's understandable. It, the Christian idea of converting is not well bred into the Hindu way at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we are what we are from the ages and the sages. Yeah. of old, thousands yeah. of years before me and uh -huh. you. Uh -huh. um, so we are what we are. We don't try to foist our way. It's on others. Uh -huh. There's a, um, um, a part of the Bhagavad Gita where the Lord Krishna is giving some advice to Arjuna uh, about uh, that, that Arjuna should be loving deeply and breaking free from ego. And I won't read the whole thing, but this, I have a couple of paragraphs I've typed out here. And the sense of it is, is um, uh, like what we've been saying, that, that this attachment and desire just torments the heart and it's a matter of breaking free. And I'll, I'll just uh, read the last couple of lines. It says, he is forever free who has broken out of the ego cage of I and mine to be united with the Lord of love. This is the supreme state. Attain thou this and pass from death to immortality. So Arjuna is trying to figure out what's his duty, what's his path. Arjuna, the warrior, is the, struggling warrior. with yeah. the, the battle. And uh, yeah. the way I interpret it, it's poetic. It's internal battle uh -huh. with himself. But uh -huh. some people say it's real life battle. Uh -huh. And so there are different interpretations in that respect. But what I would say is, what they're getting at is renouncing desire, renouncing results, and, 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 ego. and then realization. Yeah. And the realization is, yeah, it's not the ego of I this, I that. It's the realization of truth, mm -hmm. the truth of reality. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of exploration. Yeah. What is reality yeah. in our world? What is reality yeah. in life? What is reality in the universe? Yeah. Much to ponder there. Yeah, we have so much in the modern era that, that tries to confuse us about reality. They'll show us an image on a TV screen and make us believe that that's real, that you know, buying that product is, will make us happy and fulfilled and, mm -hmm. and so forth. There's so much sham, so much illusion that we really have to cut through a lot of that. This way that we're trying to understand here is always examining those kinds of things, everything. You know, you, you see the surface meaning, that what the senses see, mm -hmm. but what's, what's behind yeah. it all? I want to mention one other religious connection, then move on to, to another topic that I know is very important to you. But Albert Schweitzer, who is a great a uh, Christian theologian and doctor who served in Africa for many decades. He wrote, Gandhi continues what the Buddha began. In the Buddha, the spirit of love set itself the task of creating different spiritual conditions in the world. In Gandhi, the spirit of love undertakes to transform all worldly conditions. Yes, <laughs> yes. So. It, 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 it's, it's very simple. Truth is, Reality is, uh -huh. and that's all I mean. Uh -huh. What's truth for humans? What's uh -huh. truth for nature? What's truth for animals? Mm -hmm. You know, that's 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 comes from the same stream. Uh -huh. Jesus contributed to that. Many great thinkers throughout the world mm -hmm. have contributed yeah. to this. And and in your work, you've not only been tried to be faithful to reality, but you've also tried to change the conditions of reality, change, shift the reality so that there'd be less suffering and there'd be more human fulfillment and more love and peace and harmony. I mean, so, so you're, you're both accepting reality, I mean, accepting what is, but also shifting it. 
Exactly, because it's based on these insights. And I got insights from Thoreau and Tolstoy and um, other writers yeah, uh, yeah. from England and other places yeah. about healthy living. And so I, I, I believe that the kingdom is right here and now. Mm -hmm. It's not in a cave or on top of a yeah. mountain. Yeah. That's good. There's places yeah. there. But, you know, these are the realities we humans yeah. find ourselves yeah. in. I want to talk for a bit about um, your notion of Swaraj, which is way more than just independence. But you wrote a book, a little, uh, a small book in November 1909. You wrote it in, in about nine days. Uh, it's about self-rule for India. And the title in your own language then for self-rule for India was Hind Swaraj. Swaraj. Mm -hmm. um, what motivated you to write that book? Many things. Uh, of course, I was returning from England in a process of trying to work out rights for, for Indians. Mm -hmm. But also there I, I met with um, Indians who were for violent change. Mm -hmm. And we were struggling. They said, we can attain our freedom by violence. And I said, no, that's not the way. And so we were arguing this. Well. All these ideas were going through my mind. And as I was on that ship's canoe and castle on the way back, I got the inspiration to write this book. So I mm -hmm. wrote it in nine days. My right hand get tired, I used my left hand. Mm -hmm. And um, it's to uh, help people understand. I wanted the British to understand, and I wanted the Indians to understand. I wanted the violence uh, advocates to understand uh, my way. And, and that. That document, as simple as it is, um, still holds today, I believe. Yeah. So, what what would you? How could you summarize the core message of that of the Hin Swaraj book? To summarize the core message of Hin Swaraj, it goes back to the thinking we're we're having that every person has dignity, and dignity is involved internally with us. We have to find the truth within ourselves. We have to control the mind, the passions, so that uh, they are not harming mm -hmm. others or ourselves. So Swaraj uh, means um, mindfulness. It means uh, the mind controlling the passions mm -hmm. and its senses. Uh, the Hind is for, for India. Uh, the India, the yeah. India culture. Yeah. And of course, we were seeking freedom from the um, empire, the, the United Kingdom, and the, right. the oppressive things that I was gradually becoming more and more concerned about. And um, so, so th I mean, it, this goes way beyond this. This is way beyond a a, uh, a tract that says we got to be free. Let's have national independence. Because you're taking it at a much more profound level and I'm, more far-reaching. As I understood things. I thought we could be free without freedom, without independence. And by that I mean, if, if we take our teaching seriously about mm -hmm. Swaraj, mm -hmm. uh, we stand in dignity. And I believe every man, woman, and child, old and young, weak and strong, has that power within. Mm -hmm. No matter what the oppression, we can stand mm -hmm. in dignity by by living the truth that we have. We may be killed in that process, but that to me is, that's Swaraj. That's more important than independence. And, and it also includes uh, some of the economic independence or, and cultural independence so that the people of India don't, don't try to just mimic the English ways or get hooked into the, the, the bottom tier of the British uh, economic empire. It right. certainly does, uh, because dignity and, and, and control uh, starts here and with the daily activities we live by. Uh -huh. And to be fully human is to live by Swaraj. That's what this symbolizes okay. here. So what, what's the sense of the spinning wheel? Tell, tell us what, what that means for you then. When I returned um, in 1915, I traveled around India for a year to, to get in touch with the people and discovered that this was taken from them. And it was a way that the 
ordinary people could supplement their living to be self-supporting, to be self-sustaining, to control their lives. To, to and the to British took that from them. So the people could no longer even spin their own they could not thread and make their own cloth. So I recreated the movement, uh -huh. that, and it's a symbolic part of Suraj, uh -huh. but it's a real part. It's a way people can help yeah. live, make the, their living. Well, and the wheel is on the, the flag of India. The, after independence in India, has a flag, isn't that the... Well, that's good, but <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, independence, you, they did uh, not... Uh, no, they didn't take your advice. Because I got the uh, Congress to deal with uh, becoming uh, spinners in 1919 uh -huh. when they wanted me to lead the movement for independence. Uh -huh. I said, okay, I'll make an agreement, this, this, and this. And this fifth tradition was every one of them would start spinning a half uh -huh. hour every day uh -huh. to show the ordinary people that this was dignified work. Uh -huh. And they, they did at that time, but you know, when independence uh -huh. came, that went. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you have a concern about what we think of as civilization, and I want to give you a chance to share that thought with us. Well, uh, yes, I have a, a, a great um, feeling about independence, or uh, pardon me, civilization. Yeah, civilization. Western civilization started with the Industrial Revolution, and the way I understand that, it, it emasculates the person, emasculates the Europeans, it, it, it just uh, removes the possibility of living nonviolently mm -hmm. and with this dignity we're talking about. Is that because of the, the top-down hierarchical industrial That's part of it. alienation it, kind yes, of thing? Yes, I, I believe in the village economy, bottom-up, uh -huh. uh -huh. but it's... it's um, let me give you my definition of civilization okay. because it probably is different than what you are familiar with. Civilization is that mode of conduct which points out to man the path of duty. In Gujarati, a simple term is just good conduct. Yeah, the Gujarati language, your own native language. That's yeah. right. My, that's where I'm uh, from. Yeah. And so, so good conduct. Civilization is good conduct. It, it's, it's all these things we're talking about, relationship uh -huh. and dignity, and recognizing my own dignity and your dignity, uh -huh. and though we might be poles apart uh -huh. on some issues, uh -huh. we still have that, and we can work that out. And that goes into every aspect of our lives to be civilized. Well, um, this is just amazingly good stuff. Um, We've run out of time for this part of the interview. We have a, another special treat coming up in the remainder of the program. But for right now, um, I want to thank you, Mr. Gandhi, for the interview. It's just been a, a great honor and a great pleasure to explore these ideas with you. It's a start. Um, <laughs> well, I know there's a lot. I mean, you, you wrote so many books, and there's so many books written about you and so much to learn. So I hope people will follow up and do that. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing what you have with us. And I uh, need to talk with the, the viewers of the program for a moment, and then uh, we'll proceed with the show. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. For the, the folks watching the show, um, I want to let you know we've concluded the interview with Mohandas K. Gandhi, the Mahatma, um, and we have another treat for you. Uh, here in Olympia, Bernie Meyer, who is a longtime activist, uh, for peace and social justice and human rights has done a huge amount of study of Gandhi and he's done speaking engagements all over the United States, often in character as Gandhi. And in early 2005, he was invited to India to present Gandhi to India by one of the top Gandhi scholars of India. And so he, when he went there, he uh, was uh, acclaimed as the American Gandhi. And so in the remainder of the program, we'll be talking with Bernie Meyer, who is the, the American Gandhi uh, and was acclaimed as such in, in, uh, in India. And uh, so for the remainder of the program, uh, we'll be talking with Bernie Meyer, the American Gandhi, and bring some of these ideas up to date for our own time and place. And this will be equally uh, enjoyable and equally so here we go, and we'll just keep it going. I want to 
welcome you. Tell us about the trip. Now that you've got this, the tell us about this and and the trip. What you're wearing here. Well, as you mentioned, I was invited and went to India in January and February, or February and March of this year. Uh -huh. of, of 2005. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's right. We yeah. are now in 2006. Right. Um, and I did not know what to expect, except that Dr. Siobhan wanted me to portray Gandhi in several audiences in uh -huh. various cities. Uh -huh. So I went there with openness and um, with my uh, portrayal developments as I have been doing them uh -huh. in the United States, and I portray Gandhi in several places in Mumbai, uh -huh. in uh, which is Bombay's old. Or that's, that's right. The new name for Bombay, yeah. It's an old name, new name. Yeah. Uh, Aurangabad, where Dr. Shivan is from, and he uh -huh. has a retreat center there, and then Delhi, and uh -huh. finally Lucknow. Uh -huh. So I had several experiences portraying Gandhi, uh -huh. and uh, naturally. I was challenged and I was changed in the way I do it. Uh -huh. And so that's why I do this. I wouldn't do this before. Uh -huh. But the experience uh, gave me a mandate to bring Gandhi to the world, uh -huh. which is a little more than I can do, but I'll do what I can. <laughs> and this lay was given me by Dr. Siobhan uh -huh. at uh, a meeting of the World Citizens um, uh, organization that he started. And he said, this is a sandalwood lay. It has an odor, odor of nonviolence, and this is for you to take uh -huh. and carry Gandhi wherever you go. Uh -huh. That's great. So you have a, a, a newspaper clipping. When you came back, you showed me a clipping, and I want to I want to just show that to the, the viewers here because I thought it was so good. It's the uh, you can see the uh, the writing is clearly from a, a newspaper from India. It's a, it's a Xerox Bob. copy, mm -hmm. and and uh, you can see the lettering. But you can also see if you can see close on the um, on the photo that that's photos of of Bernie as as Gandhi, and they just the, for the descriptions from what you told me after you returned, uh, the people were just enthralled, and they also kind of grilled you on the um, uh, globalization of the economy and the U.S. role in the world and stuff, and said, what, you know, what does Gandhi say about that? It was a very serious experience, uh -huh. courteous but very serious. Uh -huh. uh, when we got to Aurangabad after two days in Mumbai where I did my first portrayal, um, I had a day at Dr. Siobhan's retreat center. He said, we might have a meeting tonight with some media people. It's kind of indefinite. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I had a whole day wondering what was going to happen, if yeah. anything was going to happen. Yeah. And he said, in the evening, put your Gandhi clothes on. We go to the conference now. <laughs> so I dressed like I am uh -huh. now uh -huh. and met in a, in a medical center with several representatives of the media. And I stood there with my stick, uh -huh, and they yeah. <laughs> asked me many questions. Not how I'm doing it or what I'm doing, but why. And I had to try to explain to them where I came from. And that was hard because they don't know the United States that well in the 60s that I was yeah. bred into nonviolence in the 60s. Right. And how many people in the United States know Gandhi and, and emulate him? And I could only guess. I didn't have any way of documenting that. Of course, I know that not many people really know Gandhi, yeah. but a lot of people know he existed. And then they started questioning me about the United States and why it wants to be a superpower. And very difficult questions with that, not because I had to dig into real feelings of, of the, the negative side of being a superpower, uh -huh. which I feel very strongly yeah, about. Yeah. So. After that was over, they stood up in front of me. They got out of their chairs and stood in front of me and said, we want you to continue portraying Gandhi. Uh -huh. Then the next day in the paper uh, were these articles, American yeah. Gandhi spreads yeah. the Bapu's yeah. vision. Yeah. Bapu is sort of a term of endearment like daddy. Yeah, Papa yeah. That's right. Thing. Yeah, so uh, that one. And then uh, now American Gandhi in city. 
this is from. Um, I don't, I don't well, know that's Lomad but... Times. Uh, this okay. one's from the uh, okay. Times of India. Okay. So, uh, I, and I had another <laughs> media <laughs> conference in Lucknow when I got uh -huh. to Lucknow uh -huh. a couple of weeks later. Both of them were similar. Well, I know you you have a, a long background going back into the into the 60s with work for peace and racial justice and anti-poverty work and all kinds of things, and you're active now on all of these kinds of things and more. I know you've done a lot of work on, on the oil crisis, the peak oil, and on... Um, well, a nuclear issue at nu ground zero. Weapons. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, how, you know, how do you bring... Uh, what, what does Gandhi have to say about like, our use of petroleum in this country? Nothing. I mean, to, directly. Nothing directly, but a lot implied. So, what, what's, what's the message? If, if you were to update, because part of what you're doing is sometimes is updating his message with applicability for our time and place. Gandhi put these clothes on in 1922 in mm -hmm. um, Madurai mm -hmm. uh, to identify with the masses, the poverty masses. 300 billion people in India at that time, most of them in poverty and being mm -hmm. driven further in poverty yeah. by, the, um, by the United Kingdom. Uh -huh. So his point of view is we don't need a lot to get by on, to live on. Everybody has it. We've got enough for every man's need, but not every man's greed, he said at that time. Mm -hmm. So coming out of this thinking that everybody has a right to a dignified life and analyzing our world and analyzing the fact that oil is an artificial way of sustaining society and it's not sustainable. Right. We're consuming the natural resources of the world. Mm -hmm. To go into that analysis uh -huh. from a Gandhi perspective, the spinning wheel, everybody have a yeah. right to dignified way of making a right. living. Right. We got two billion people in this world yeah. living on less than two dollars a day. You got to do that analysis uh -huh. from a Gandhi perspective of looking at it through the eyes uh -huh. of the low uh -huh. People on a total pole, but yeah. even we in the United States have some difficult things to wake up yeah, to. Yeah. Um, what about uh, if you were to think about uh, the Satyagraha approach to dealing with conflicts, and you look at here in the United States, this big superpower that thinks it can run the world. I mean, we've got a massive change that's long overdue in our national personality and foreign policy. Um, how, how, how would you want to apply uh, Gandhi's principles to U.S. foreign policy, U.S. government policies on domestic issues or In or many anything? different ways. But to make it simple for this short time. Yeah, because we, had, short we only time, have a few minutes left, actually. Um, I would say I would want every person in this country to understand what is coming because of global warming, peak oil, other natural resources. And I would want everyone to say a grassroots movement because the people, the head of corporations and the politics, they're, they're too pressed in their position and perspective. I would want the grassroots to say, truth is we're living in an unsustainable way of life mm -hmm. and we need a massive transition and we're gonna take a lot of work to do it. Mm -hmm. We got to start now. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the truth, the reality. The truth. The truth is always there. Yeah. The force, truth, force. That's yeah. satya, yeah. graha, yeah. and and of course, the ahimsa is the way we do it. So, yeah. what about a massive hunger strike or yeah. a massive uh, closing the the work down for a period yeah. of time until we get the conversation on the table yeah. so we yeah. all can realize yeah. that we're all affected by this. Yeah, getting the conversation on the table is one of the first steps uh, in, you know, m as long as it can be repressed and set aside and ignored, uh, we will never deal with it. The first step toward changing is making it something that, that, that needs to get talked about. And there's forces, powerful forces economically working against it, but I think this force could be as powerful or yeah. more powerful. What would you like to see the progressive movements here in this country be doing to, in using Gandhian principles, whether you think of the peace movement or the economic justice or anti-globalization or human rights or whatever. 
Uh, well, how, what I cannot see? see this division between all these different movements you mentioned. To okay. me, compartmentalization is not my way. Uh -huh. it's, it's all one. Yeah. So uh, I would say to them, if you're thinking just environment or just um, peace or uh -huh. just economics or just poverty, you, mm -hmm. you got it. That's yeah. wrong. You yeah. got to get the whole thing and then work together. Yeah. Well, we, you, you and I, Bernie, were both involved with uh, putting on a conference, two conferences actually, on peak oil. And, and the one that we did on May 14th of 2004. Five. Five. <laughs> 2005. We started 2004. Was, yeah, started, started working out there and put on this conference. And that, that conference about peak oil had peace movement, labor movement, environmental people, all people getting together and, and say this is a shared problem. We all have a stake in this. And so that was there we tried to do this in a good multi-issue way. And I, I think a lot of these a lot of these problems have multiple components and so people need to see the interconnections so that we can have a, a large mass movement and not just the individual angles. Well like we need said. to keep challenging each other on that because there's different interests in each of those groups yeah. and um, different constituencies yeah. and some of them are uh, more beholden to the existing way that's dysfunctional and non-sustainable than others. So uh -huh. to keep challenging ourselves to what is the yeah. truth for us here. Yeah. Um, do you have advice for folks here in Olympia or for folks in Washington State or other local grassrootsy levels as opposed to just the, the whole big national? Do, well, the same do, thing, a local or national, we, we got to deal with the truth of, of our way of life. Mm -hmm. And that's everything from the way you and I get along mm -hmm. to international relationships. Yeah, and what you we know. own and what we drive. And right, we got to deal with the truth. How much we use and what we eat. And yeah, this, this debate in Olympia about should we deal with nuclear weapons at City Hall or not uh -huh. is a good example of uh -huh. the confusion. And we got to keep talking about it yeah. until we get some clear yeah. understanding. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. We've actually covered the big chunks of things that we wanted to cover, so I'm glad we did that because I know we had a full agenda to get through. Do you have uh, closing thoughts, a minute or so of closing thought, or a minute or less, half a minute? I, I summarize my teaching. Untruth is quenched by truth. Anger is quenched by love. Violence is quenched by suffering. This is the way not only for the saints, but for everyone. Uh -huh. Great. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that we had time to spend both with the Mahatma himself for the first two-thirds of the show and now for the last portion with, with Bernie Meyer, my good friend, uh, who's, a, who's also the American Gandhi. And as you can see, I talk like the <laughs> Hindi Gandhi as yeah, the American Gandhi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great, great to have you. Thank you so much for doing that. We want to thank the folks who have been watching also. There are a huge number of books and other resources around on Gandhi. The 1982 film is very good. Uh, and uh, from time to time, the, I, I've been conducting study groups on Gandhi through the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, and we'll be doing more of those uh, in the fall of 2006 and, and into the future. For information about a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolence, you can contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at area code 360-491-9093, and the website for the Olympia FOR is www.olyfor.org. We're all one human family. We all share this one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks. <laughs>